The Pediatric Lounge, a podcast taking you behind the door of the Physician's Lounge to get a deeper insight into just what docs are talking about today. From the clinically profound to the wonderfully routine and everything in between. Well, hello, welcome. This weekend we have a special edition, two wonderful guests from the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. With us today is the very famous rock star pediatrician, Dr. Paul Offit, author of You Bet Your Life and The Cutter Incident, How Americans' First Polio Vaccine Led to the Growing Vaccine Crisis. There's no need for any further introduction of such a well-known and esteemed colleague and pediatrician. Please welcome him and Dr. George Rogo and listen with us for the next hour as we talk about many things that involve viruses, vaccines, and children. Well, good afternoon, Dr. Offit. This is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. We much appreciate you coming out to talk to practicing pediatricians across America. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Hi, George. Welcome to the podcast again. Hi, Herb. It's, uh, it's not Tuesday, as it usually is, but today we have Dr. Offit, who's like a rock star in pediatrics, <laughs> in my eyes. Yeah. He certainly is. Yeah. Well, I would like to spend the next two hours of the day talking to him about his book, his fascinating book. But I know the audience has a lot of other questions, and some of the people that listen to the podcast are not physicians. So my first question is, how have vaccines changed mo- modern healthcare in your from your vantage point? Well, even just in my lifetime, I mean, the, you know, I was a resident um, at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh in uh, the late 1970s and Haemophilus influenza B dominated my life um, in that, you know, we saw a lot of meningitis, a lot of buccal cellulitis. It was the most common cause of septic arthritis, which probably nobody remembers. Um, And of course, meningitis. I mean, we took care of that that disease uh, certainly every few days, these, you know, especially with meningitis. So, and then, you know, we had a, a hemophilus influenza B a polysaccharide vaccine, which was replaced by the conjugate vaccine. And that disease virtually disappeared. It is the rare physician, at least pediatrician at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, who's ever seen that disease. And polio. I mean, well, I mean, I'm that old because I don't know your, your viewers can't see me, but trust me, I'm that old. So, you know, with polio, um, or, or is it is this? Or do people see me? Or this is yeah, just, they're going to see you too. See me. Okay, so you can tell that I'm that old. So in any case, yeah. the um, you know, I mean, my I remember my mother um, how she cried when you know in 1955 the announcement was made that the polio vaccine was now available. So. I was a first and second grader there, but I certainly remember that moment. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, think about that. Pneumococcal disease, you know, dominated our lives. I mean, rotavirus was, yeah, at least in the 1970s, you know, you were admitting kids all the time. It was about 75,000 admitted a year in this country with de- with severe dehydration from rotavirus. So, I mean, you don't have to, have, you know, um, be 200 years old to realize that vaccines have saved our lives and changed our lives. Well, some of those diseases, even Herb and I saw in the 90s, dehydration and Prevnar and uh, pneumococcal disease. And we shared in the pain, uh, George suffered from measles as a resident. Yeah. And I suffered from varicella two years after fin- finishing my residency. Supposedly, I had had it chicken pox as a kid. My mom swears that I did. And I said, Mom, there is no way on earth you get it twice. You yeah. don't know what, you, what I got. Yeah. Uh, but it was miserable. I was out of work for three weeks. Nobody, nobody believed me that I had chicken pox. The internist was laughing on the phone. Um, it was just, it, it was a painful disease. And I had the measles when I was an intern. Um, there was an epidemic. There was an outbreak in 1993 in Jersey City. Of course, I was working in the ER. We were admitting these kids with dehydration, pneumonias, poor eating, the works, high fever, rashes, like two or three a night. And then one day I went to work and I just passed out and broke out in the classic rash, 105 fever. They put me in the you know, internal medicine ward. Um, and it wasn't until one of the pediatric residents came in and looked at me and said, hey, you look like those kids were admitted and gave the diagnosis. These guys were going with all these you know, esoteric diseases, all these problems. And you know, but you know, measles is a bad disease. I was admitted for two weeks in a hospital. 
Measles makes you sick. I, I, you know, it's funny, the, the, when, when Jenny McCarthy was on Oprah and she said, uh, you know, the, 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 the false concern that the combination of measles, mumps, rubella, and MR vaccine caused autism. And she said, you know, I'll take the freaking measles every time, um, which tells you not only have we largely eliminated measles from this country, we've eliminated the memory of measles. I mean, when people ask me to come down to the emergency department because a child has a fever and a rash and they're wondering whether it's measles, I can tell you in 30 seconds whether it's measles because yeah. children are sick. At the very least, that you know, they're often photophobic because they have essentially a mild encephalopathy. And so they're, you know, they're squinting and they're looking down They're as distinct from others like enterovirus rashes, which cause right. fever and rash. They're not as sick as with me. Measles makes you sick. Very yeah. sick. Very and sick. mumps, I got to see in Costa Rica, uh, young adults or older adolescents on something that they call the, the testicle sling. So they would get orchitis and they would be hospitalized and they would have their testicles on a sling in a bed with ice packs. And I'm like, thank God I have a vaccine for that. What a miserable disease. Um, and you know, very interesting with the measles, you would ask, why did I get the measles? Cause I was of the generation that had the measles vaccine, but I was of the generation that you could have had one or you could have had two when you went to kindergarten. So I guess before um, they had computers and stuff, somehow I didn't get that second dose, you know? Yeah, so that's interesting. Usually, usually one dose was enough. So, so the that measles vaccine was first introduced in 1963. The, the last best measles vaccine was in 1967. Right. Um, and between 89 and 91, you're right. There was this, this sweeping outbreaks of measles across the country. What they found for the most part was that um, people who had one dose were for the most part protected. But that second dose sort of gave you a second chance to get your first dose. But that was the birth in the early 90s of the second dose. Correct. Correct. And then, you know, I, they got the, vac the blood titers to go to work for internship. Right. And of course, nobody looked. And then they discovered it in hindsight. Oh, you never had titers. <laughs> well, at least you got the titers, right? right. Oh, now I got plenty. So, so now he knows we're, we're almost equally as old as he is, not as smart, but we're almost equally as old. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about cancer because I never thought of this in medical school, that cancer has, uh, excuse me, HPV vaccine has given us the opportunity to eliminate cervical and neck cancer. Am I correct when I say that? It gives us the opportunity to dramatic, certainly dramatically reduce, if not eliminate, cervical cancer. Right. Yes. Um, but you're right. HPV causes anal, genital, as well as head and neck cancer. Look at Australia, which has much higher immunization rates against HPV than we do. They have dramatically lessened that, that disease, the, the, that cancer, but it takes time, right? Because the incubation period from when you're first infected with HPV to when you get, say, uh, cervical cancer is 20, 25 years. So it's going to take time for a, a vaccine that was introduced in 2006 in this country. I count that as amongst the miracles of, mo of modern medicine. Would, would, would I be exaggerating when I say that? No, uh, it's, it's, it was the second major cancer preventing vaccine, right? The first was the, the hepatitis B vaccine which prevents, you know, a known cause of liver cancer. So, yes. yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about wanting to prevent cancer. There's two vaccines that do it. Right. And that's a miracle that I don't think we talk about enough. Um, why not vaccinate kids at like with hepatitis B at birth in six months with HPV? That's a very good question. Why not give HPV vaccine? At birth? Well, first of all, you, you could. Meaning, I think that technology, so, so the hepatitis B vaccine and the HPV vaccine are made with similar technologies, right? It, it, those are recombinant DNA purified protein vaccines. Um, what we found with the hepatitis B vaccine is that when you give those first few doses in the first year of life, you get long lived immunity, right? Long lasting immunity. 30 years later, you know, because that vaccine that was really first introduced in the early 1980s, but that was an older group. And then it's now officially became a vaccine for infants in, in the early 1990s. So we've had 30 years of that vaccine and you have, and we basically eliminated hepatitis B in less than 18 year old. So could you give HPV in, in, in the first year of life and have long lived immunity? Yes, you could. That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm not sure why we don't do it. Maybe it's political. I mean, maybe it's just people think, you know, this is a sexually transmitted disease primarily. So I don't want to, you know, uh, my child's only, you know, few days old. <laughs> but, but hepatitis B is primarily a, a sexually transmitted disease if it's not through blood transfusion, or you don't get it from your mother as you're born. So what there's really no difference. But you can get hepatitis B in, in manners other than sexual 
you can you can get sharing toothbrushes as a way you could get HP, okay. HPV HPV virus HPV really you can get HPV by passing through a birth canal which has HPV in it but yes. for the most part it's really sexually transmitted after that okay. hepatitis B has other routes of transmission so okay and then um, I want to I know you do a lot of vaccine advocacy work and I want to talk a little bit about vaccination gaps and in my mind with just what we've talked about uh, it just breaks my heart that the CDC reports that only 59% of 13 year olds in America have two doses of HPV. 75% have one dose, but they don't come back for the second dose. So that means roughly 25% is easy money. They've already agreed to the shot. They just forgotten to come back for the shot. Um, but we talked about that. I would say vaccinated the, the newborn and at six month visit, we're done. Bye bye. Let's not even talk about how it's transmitted. It's another cancer vaccine like hepatitis B. Spank the baby in the butt and let's move on. Um, I'm with you. Let's do all it. All right. Okay. So I like that. I, I like it when really smart people agree with me. Um, the one question, and I, I don't like to talk politics in the podcast, but the one question that has to me been kind of a problem, and I've um, sort of heard you in a very kind way, you're a very kind person, um, articulate something very similar. Um, has the appearance of political goals hurt our credibility in vaccines over the last three years? How do you mean? How do you mean? What do you mean by political goals? Exactly. For example, I listened to you talking about your vote against the Om Omicron specific uh, vaccine that was proposed. So you you were one of the two of the twenty one members, and you voted against it because. You felt there wasn't enough data. You, you you use stronger words than that, but not enough data, and that and you did. This is not the word you use, but you felt that um, it was already cooked into the books. When you walked in there, the the scientists had already uh, brought somebody from the WHO to, rep to represent the point of view that it was necessary. The staff had already agreed with that, and the next day, the administration said, "We're ready to go with the vaccine." Um, That's what the, you mean by political? Is that what yeah, you mean by political? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, it's subtle. I, I think at that meeting, which was a June 28th meeting by the FDA's Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, I think it was um, strongly desired by the administration that we have a bivalent vaccine that contained the ancestral strain and then an Omicron subvariant. I think that was the interest. Now, although that wasn't the question we were asked, the question we were asked was, did we agree with an Omicron um, component to a essentially a bivalent vaccine for the fall. Um, well, Omicron's BA1, uh, which is gone. So the, the, it would have been better, I think, if they made it very clear that it was an Omicron subvariant. I still would have voted no, but, but I think okay. it would have been, I mean, the, the saying Omicron when Omicron is essentially gone from, from this country seemed to, to not make a lot of sense. But you're right. I mean, there was, there was a, the, here, it's, I'm not sure if it's, is it political? Maybe that's it. I, and, and that it's something I think the administration wanted. It, when I think of political, I think sort of right versus left. And this, this wasn't that. But. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. All, 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 all politicians have policy agendas uh, that, you know, some way, somehow interact with our taking care of patients. Um, so their policy event was to get this Omicron vaccine out. Um, but it, it, it feels to me that um, this might, you know, this might give people who don't understand the value of vaccines some cause or something to hang on to, to say that, you know, this is all driven by policy and not science. And that, I that worries you know, I, I see your point. I, he, he, you're right. I, I mean, I think, you know, when, during the uh, Trump administration, for example, um, there was this, a, a real sense that the, the for, for the first time in my lifetime, that the, at least that I was paying attention, was that the, um, the administration could twist the arm of the FDA or twist the arm of the CDC. I mean, hydroxychloroquine was an example of that. Um, they basically pushed the FDA to approve through emergency use authorization hydroxychloroquine when there was not a shred of evidence that it either treated or prevented COVID. And then three months later, when because it's not that hard to do those studies, when the studies were very clear that it did neither of those things, neither treated nor prevented COVID, they withdrew that EUA. So that was three months. They approved it and they withdrew it. I think that shook people. It shook people enough that they that people didn't trust that the vaccines were going to be um, held to the same standard as other vaccines in terms of safety follow-up. In other words, you, you usually, 
it, when you see serious adverse events associated with vaccines, they, they invariably really do occur within two months of getting a dose. So that's always been the, the, the minimum standard, which is you have two months of follow up after the last dose. But there was clearly a push by the Trump administration because this was now October. They wanted to to or September. They wanted to they the Trump administration wanted the an, the an EUA approval for those vaccines before the election day, which was November third. Now, if you're going to have the two month follow up, that took you till December, which was a month after November third. And so, I know that Commissioner Hahn was under tremendous pressure to do that. And and you know you had what what ended up happening was. You know, Kaiser Family Foundation did a survey that found that most people didn't trust that, that this was going to be held to a safety standard. You found um, that there were letters written by Congress um, to, you know, to the FDA and to, to the uh, to, to others saying, we don't trust that this is going to be done the right way. I actually wrote an op-ed piece with Zeke Emanuel in the New York Times, it's fearing the October surprise. And worse, you had states that basically had formed their own vaccine advisory committee. That's right. They didn't yeah. trust that our vaccine advisory committee, the FDA's vaccine advisory committee, was going to be free of politics. And we are free of politics. I, I just like to say that. We're, okay. we're an advisory committee, right? I mean, so, so we're independent of the government. We're independent of the pharmaceutical industry. And people can always not listen to our advice. I mean, we're in academic medicine. We're used to people not listening to our advice all the time. So just right. give the best advice you can. And if people ignore you, they ignore you. But it didn't work out that way. I, I just like saying Commissioner Hans, Stephen Hahn's defense, he 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 stood tall. He said, you know, he put something on the FDA's website saying we are following this up for two months after the last dose. And he knew that that's not what the administration wanted, but he stood tall. So got to give him credit. Didn't Good stand is. so tall hydroxychloroquine but he stood tall on that so you got to give him credit for that yeah kudos to him right and and the both moderma and uh, pfizer had open letters where they said they would not release the vaccine until right. they, they it was safe so so all those things were great um i'm a little interested or a lot interested on a short version of your inventing the rototech vaccine and for those in the audience that are either too young or not pediatricians there's a certain rancid acid smell to the stool of a kid with rotavirus. Right. You could tell before you went in the room to examine them, like, oh no, that kid's throwing up, the brother's gonna throw up, the mother's gonna throw up. If I don't get out of this room quickly, I'm gonna throw up too. How did that all come about? That's a wonderful journey and saved, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of lives. Uh, people don't understand children die from diarrhea and dehydration, even under the best of care. So how did that happen? And how did you do it? I know it took about 20 years from when you thought about it till the day that you got FDA approval. Right, it was a 26 year effort, but I, I can uh, condense that 26 years into about two minutes. But he, here's, here's how that worked. First of all, Stanley Plotkin headed that program. I mean, here, here's the man who is um, the inventor of the RE27 three strain of rubella vaccine, which we still use in this country that came into being in 1979. He did seminal work on the, the, the current rabies vaccine, meaning the human diploid cell vaccine, which got us away from you know the duck embryo vaccine, which had some pretty significant side effects. He was He was, brilliant, a man who had taken a, a, a gone from bench to bedside. So he understood how that all worked. Um, the other member of that team was Dr. Fred Clark, who was an, uh, sort of a veterinary pathog viral pathogenesis person. And, and because the vaccine that, the, that we ultimately created was a bovine human reassortant vaccine, he was seminal in terms of, of, of you know, being able to participate. So it was the three of us that were able to do this. But, you know, again, it's like the Isaac Newton quote, which is you see farther because you stand on the shoulders of giants. Realize that there are hundreds of researchers internationally that were working on rotavirus to understand things like what part of the virus or what gene in the virus codes for proteins that make you sick. I mean, what are the diarrhea genes? What are the genes that code for proteins that evoke neutralizing antibodies? What are the genes that code for proteins that evoke cytotoxic T cell responses? And showing, because this was initially understood to be an animal um, pathogen, it really wasn't defined as a human pathogen until the, uh, the early 80s, late 70s. And, but the, the veterinarians have been working on it since the 40s. So that they, had, they were way ahead of the, uh, the clinicians on that. And then it was just a matter of knowing, knowing that, like the smallpox vaccine, where you have sort of species barriers are high, meaning, you know, calf rotaviruses cause smallpox in calves, but not humans and vice versa. I mean, that's what Edward Jenner took advantage of. And we too, we just created this series of reassortant viruses that had 
retain the attenuated virulence characteristics of the animal strain, in this case, a bovine virus, but included the genes, the human genes that coded for proteins that were protective, knowing that we didn't include all the genes that conferred virulence, meaning there were four rotavirus genes that convert virulence, so you don't include all of them, just includes the ones that evoke the protective response. So that's what we did. We created those strains, and then we went through the phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and that took 26 years, which is why I'm enormously jealous that, you know, you have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which was isolated and sequenced in January of 2020, and 11 months later, you have <laughs> two large clinical trials with a novel technology that showed the virus, the vaccine was highly effective, and the reason was, Operation Warp Speed, which basically took the risk out of it for pharmaceutical companies. I mean, what, they, what Operation Warp Speed did more than anything else was they, first of all, they bet on five horses. So it's not like, you know, you go to a race, normally you bet on one horse to win, they bet on number of horses to win. And they took the risk out of it for the companies. Just, just may, you know, mass produce it. And if it works, great. And if it doesn't, we'll end up throwing all that away. And that it does not normally happen. It's the companies that take the, the risk. So, so I have one question about that. Um, because it was fascinating reading your book. You said this was Dr. Fauci's idea. And in my mind, he was, or, or it was his leadership uh, to say, throw $20 billion at the problem, spread it out through 10 companies, whoever wins and comes with a vaccine up front, we all win, which is a venture capitalist mindset. Buy a, you know, a, a billion dollars in 10 different companies, I don't care if nine fail, one will win and I'll be, you know, make 25 billion off of that. I would have thought, and this is again political, but I would have thought this would have come from somebody like Jared Kushner or, you know, uh, some, some, some guy that's doing finance in New York that does this every, every year. This is how they play with money in New York. Uh, am I right in this? This was coming out of the scientific community, not the business community? It certainly came out of the scientific community. I mean, it was really Peter Mark Marx, who's the head of CBER, you know, Centers for Biological Evaluation Research at the FDA, who came up with the term Operation Warp Speed. But it was Rick Bright, and it was it was the scientists and public health people that 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 did this. But you know, you had certainly, I mean, the the Moderna's vaccine, well, it came out of NIH, so that was Barney Graham and, and Kizzy Corbett and that group at NIH. And then at Penn, you had Drew Weissman and Caitlin Carrico, who was working with BioNTech and in. in uh, Europe that that created then the what ended up being Pfizer's vaccine, but it's not you know it's not a um, it wasn't a novel technology in the sense that people have been working on mRNA vaccines since 2005. It was and we're working with with uh, primarily with HIV. And then when when this virus hit, it was logical because it's the fastest way to make a vaccine. The, the thing with mRNA is you just need to know the mRNA gene segment that codes for the spike protein, because it's always the surface protein you go after, right? Whether it's hepatitis B, HPV, those are all surface proteins. So you knew that, it was just a matter of plugging it in and then hoping that it worked. And it did. <laughs> That's amazing. You get no experience with that as a vaccine. And so that, that was remarkable. It is a remarkable story. And I was interested in reading that the rate limiting step in that was a lipid molecule that you have to put the mRNA into when you inject it so it stays whole till it reaches the cell? And that was That's the good. hardest part? Right, well, so mRNA is labile. Um, okay. It breaks down quickly. So you need to, in order to get it into the cells like antigen presenting cells, like uh, dendritic cells, you need to encase it in a lipid nanoparticle. I honestly think the hardest part of this whole process was mass producing that. The, the, the old line, and I, I hold on to this, is true. The hardest part of making vaccines is making the vaccine. Mass producing vaccines is not easy. And you never scaled up a lipid nanoparticle before, and they can be sticky. So it was that was just remarkable. I had a friend of mine who used to be the um, head of the Merck uh, manufacturing division who called me up very early in this process and said, we've never scaled up lipid nanoparticles before. This is not going to be easy, um, but it worked out well. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's a miracle. It really is a miracle. When you share the story of your mom crying of the vaccine, I cried with my dad as we left the hospital with the second dose of COVID. Um, he's at the time, he was maybe 83, he's 84 now. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a miracle. Um, some of our colleagues, some of our pediatrician uh, colleagues um, ask whether, and I understand from reading your book that medical innovation is really messy and COVID, COVID was even more messy because it's a virus we'd never seen, we had no experience with, 
we were trying to figure it out on the go and we made a lot of mistakes as we did stuff, which is to be understood. We, we, we didn't have any data to make these judgments on, but the people were trying to do the best as they went along. Um, but there's certainly within the pediatric community, some sense that the school closings and mandates uh, did more harm for the kids than they did good. There's a lot of mental illness and a lot of loss of educational achievement. Um, is that a fair assessment? Understanding that people were, were meaning to do well. Um, they just, we just didn't have all the data. Yeah, I, I think what we learned fairly quickly was that this is a virus that primarily kills older people. I mean, about 80% of the deaths from people over 65, probably close to 92% of the deaths from people over 55. But children can die. I mean, there's been more than a thousand deaths, something like now I think it's around 1300 deaths of children, which when you look at the, the fact that more than a million people have died here, it represents 0.1% of the deaths, but nonetheless, children can die. I think that, um, that, and that's why the studies were done the way they were done. You sort of started with older people and then you work your way down ultimately. So it was only recently that we had a vaccine for the less than five-year-old. But children can suffer and be hospitalized and go to the ICU and die, even the less than five year old. You know, there's been reported two million deaths. But if you look at zero prevalence studies, that, that's that's a low number. Right. And there's been thousands who've been hospitalized. There's been 200 that the CDC lists as having died at less than five. You know, that's that's in the same range of what you're seeing with, you know, with varicella or measles. So it's certainly a vaccine that was worthwhile. But I do think you're 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 right to the extent that nobody paid a price psychologically i think more than, than children who lost that socialization that they so desperately need when they're growing up and learning so i, I do think uh, that's true um that, that 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 it's always easier in retrospect but i think they did certainly suffer that i, I agree with that and i think even now you know people are pushing back on mask mandates in school so you sort of understand that yeah so we have another uh for a colleague who uh, was uh, has a, a elementary school age kid as her patient, and uh, they're mandating that she get three doses of the vaccine before she come back to school, and that they mask. And you know, I don't understand why we're trying to mask two or three year olds. They're not going to wear the mask. It's not an N95 mask. They, for the most part, do great. And I think this is where I I feel like these mandates are counterproductive because people can read and say, this doesn't make any sense. Well, who's so they're mandating the vaccine for a less than five-year-old. Yeah, in a wow. private school. And my advice to her is tell the parents to switch schools because, I mean, they're mandating it. What are you going to do? You're going to sue them? That's Either a private school. They can do what they want. But They can do what they want. I'm not, I mean, I just think... Uh, it's too bad. I mean, I think in a better way, you know, if you look at, at um, the way vaccines have played out for children, I mean, well, Pfizer's vaccine was for anybody over 16, and that came out in December of 2020. But when you when you went down to the sort of the 12 to 15 year old, that was approved last May. So we've had more than a year of that vaccine approval, yet only about 60% of kids have gotten to 40% have it. If you look at the, um, the vaccines for the 5 to 11 year old, that was approved last November. So we've had about eight months of of available for that vaccine, but fewer than 40% of kids have gotten that vaccine. And now for, for the less than five-year-old, I, I think it's like 3%. It's, you know, very, right. very low number have gotten that vaccine. But in a better world, I mean, if you if I had a child who was two years of age, I'd vaccinate them in a second. Uh, the, the thing that I think people don't, don't quite embrace yet or understand, this virus is going to be with us for decades. Uh, this isn't virus isn't going anywhere. It's a short incubation period, mucosal respiratory virus. Even if the entire world were vaccinated, you would still have mild disease and spread. I mean, it's our, our vaccine, the rotavirus vaccine, was made to protect against an intestinal pathogen that is a short incubation period mucosal disease. So we can prevent hospitalization and we can prevent ICU admissions and we can prevent the 60 or so deaths that occurred every year in this country from rotavirus. But that virus still circulates in the community. It does. I mean, it still has, yes. you know, still, you're, you're not going to eliminate because Maybe. for the most part, protection against mild illness is mediated by neutralizing antibodies, which are generally short lived, you know, three to six months. So the good news is memory cells protect you against serious disease and memory cells are long lived. So that's what you can, so, so for long incubation period disease, like measles, mumps, rubella, you can eliminate those diseases because, because all you need is memory. And memory is long lived because memory, because it's a long incubation period, you have plenty of time to activate and differentiate, say, memory B cells that will make antibodies and prevent even mild disease. 
So that's why we did eliminate measles in this country in the year 2000. Yeah. It's come back because a critical percentage of parents have chosen not to vaccinate their children. We eliminated rubella by 2005. Smallpox is another long incubation period disease. We eliminated that from the face of the earth by the late 70s, but it's hard to eliminate short incubation period diseases. And so, so the virus is going to be with us every year, three and a half to more, four million children are born in this country who are completely susceptible to this virus, and they're going to grow up. So you're going to, you're going to need a highly sort of protected population for a long time. Remember, there's four strains of human coronavirus that are circulating. Um, the first two were identified in the early 60s. They came from bats. It's generally where coronavirus has come from. Um, and, and the first entered the human population in the late 1700s. The other one entered the human population in the late 1800s. This virus is going to be with us for my lifetime, for my children's lifetime, and for their children's lifetime. So the only question is when you're going to vaccinate, because as was said very early when this virus came uh, into this country, you're going to have two choices over time, which is either get vaccinated or get naturally infected. And natural infection is never the better choice. Okay. I, I... I was asked before the vaccine got approved if I was going to get myself vaccinated when it got approved. And when I read your book, I had to laugh because my answer was, I might die from the vaccine, but I'm kind of a stubborn, hard-headed human being. So I'd rather die fighting than not get vaccinated and spend six weeks in an ICU belly down in diapers. Um, so, you know, to me, that was the answer. Uh, before the science was there. I do have a question because with um, many other illnesses that we, we have vaccines for, uh, if you have like measles, mumps, uh, varicella, if you have had the disease before um, and you have immunity, we don't, go, we don't necessarily need to vaccinate you again. So maybe, you know, depends who you read, 80 to 90% of children that are alive today, not the ones being born, uh, have already had COVID and they have survived, um, many of them asymptomatic. What's wrong with saying my kid already had COVID, he doesn't need the vaccine right now? It's a reasonable question. Here's what I would say. If you look at sort of the capacity of natural infection to protect, um, certainly natural infection can protect against severe disease, but at some level, it does depend on the nature of the natural infection. In other words, you're less likely to be protected if you had a very mild or asymptomatic infection than if you had a, a, a more vigorous infection. That said, uh, the data aren't great. I, I think that like, as you said, all, um, for the most part, all viruses, when you when you survive natural infection, you develop immunological memory, which does protect you against severe disease. And I still think that's true. I mean, I was actually asked by the administration to weigh on this, weigh in on this when, when mandates first started happening. When mandates first started happening, the right vaccine comes out in December. And then, you know, once once it was the vaccine was available for all, the mandates came. And so, you know, I was asked the question actually by our administration, uh, current administration, if someone comes to say, say you mandate the vaccine in your hospital, um, and someone comes to you and says, I've been infected. I believe I have immunological memory. I believe I am protected against severe disease. I don't feel I have to get vaccinated. Um, the, the, do I think that that's reasonable? Yes, it's, it's bureaucratically, it's tougher, right? Because you could say, look, here's my, my PCR positive test, which you can easily forge. The, the better way to do that would be to have someone show that they have antibodies against the viral nuclear protein, which can only happen if you're naturally infected. But bureaucratically, that's a nightmare. And also, if you do get even just one dose of an mRNA vaccine, if you've been naturally infected, that acts like your second dose. So I, I wish in retrospect, frankly, the CDC had said that because there were okay. five studies very early showing that for those who were naturally infected, getting one dose of vaccine was like getting that second dose. So at least leave it at that. But you're okay. right. I think that's, that's a very good point. That, that's a very fair way to answer it. Um, and then one of our pediatricians in Ro Rhode Island was very interesting because you talk about, a, a, about this being a mucosal uh, virus and doesn't get into the bloodstream. And so his question was, do you think there's some hope for the nasal vaccine? And would that be a game changer? Should we be spending time looking into that? Right. Um, here's what I would say. Um, and I'm a hopeful guy. I am a Philadelphia Eagle season ticket holder. Okay. It's just so we're clear as to what my background is here. But um, 
So the thinking behind a nasal spray vaccine is that what you, in, it, you do is you induce secretory IgA responses at the, at the nasal mucosal surface. And you also introduce uh, memory B and T cells in NALT, right? Nasal associated lymphoid tissue. So you do that. The thinking then is that, so then when you're exposed to the virus, because the virus enters you know, through the nose and mouth, that therefore you'll make an, an immune response at the site of entry uh, which will then make you less likely to shed virus, less likely to be contagious, and may be a better vaccine. Um, the problem is um, effector functions at mucosal surfaces like IgA are also short-lived. This is true with the rotavirus vaccine. I mean, the rotavirus vaccine induces IgA at the mucosal surface, but a year later, that's gone. What you do have is you have immunological memory, but it, it, these are short incubation period diseases still, so it takes time for those, those immune memory cells to become activated, and dif differentiated, and become effector cells. So I think um, in the, I'm not so sure that's the answer. I mean, certainly the flu mist did not, was not a game changer. No. That was a nasal spray flu vaccine. That had other problems aside from the ones that I just mentioned. But the, 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 if people are trying to make a vaccine that for a long period of time prevents a mild disease, good luck. The fact is, you, you, unless you can figure out a way to lengthen the incubation period, which you're not going to do, um, I think you're just going to have to live with this. And the hard part of that is that when the virus first came into this country, right, January 2020, we didn't have vaccines, we didn't have monoclonal antibodies, we didn't have um, antiviral right. agents, we had convalescent plasma, but it was generally underused. And for like a year almost, all you had was barrier protection, and you didn't even have that at the beginning because we had such a shortage of masks and gas and right. nurses in our hospital wearing man bandanas over their face. I mean, so all we had was that. So the only thing we had was isolate, test, quarantine, social distance. That's all you had. And and the the more frightening part is that unlike say SARS one or MERS there was a lot of asymptomatic transmission. So anybody you came in contact with was potentially somebody who could infect you. And, and that's the mindset we're coming off of, that, that mindset of this sort of zero tolerance mindset. Now, as we're moving into, the, into an area where you probably have 90% population immunity, we'll see what happens this winter, but I, I would be surprised if the increase in hospitalizations and deaths this winter in any sense approached what we saw the last two winters. I, I would think there'll be a bump, but it will be a mild bump, would be my guess. But, you know, the problem with this virus is you're always wrong, but that's going to be my guess anyway. I'm going to go on record as being wrong. Um, yes. And so, so, and again, you're going to have to sort of ultimately accept mild illness as part of this because you have to. And, um, and coming off where we were in the first year, it's very hard to change that mindset. Yes. Yes. It's been a very difficult journey. I, I don't envy the job that you had and all the other very, very smart people in the room trying to figure out what to do without the data. Um, Herbert, would I be wrong? I have a question. Um, the mandates of vaccines, I, that's what makes people a little leery to vaccine. Because I remember at the beginning, when you start, when you started giving the vaccine, people were going, flocking to get the vaccines. They couldn't wait to get it. We opened our clinics. We would give it. People would come. We'd get hundreds of shots out. And then the moment that they started with mandates at schools and colleges and things, that's when things changed. And now it's, it's flowing into, you know, the younger kids. We used to give a lot of vaccines. Now we, we had to shut down our COVID clinics to at least once a month only because not enough people take them. That's pretty sad. Yeah, you're, you're right. We hit a wall. I mean, it, it's been true actually for all, all age groups. I mean, with sort of, yeah. the, you know, the sort of 12 to 15 year old, you had a dramatic drop yeah. and, then, and then same thing with the five, the big spike comes down. Now it's true year too. With a young child, um, I, I'm, you may be right. It may have been that we started to mandate the vaccines, but I, I, because certainly, unlike previously, I don't think there was ever really a politics to the anti-vaccine movement. Uh, uh, but there is now. I mean, it, on yeah. the left, it was always it was sort of like purity on the left, freedom on the right. Right? That, that you wanted the, the on the left, it was um, you know all things natural. I don't want to put anything in my body. It's unnatural. Um, you know, the, the chemical things with chemical names. Water, by the way, is chemical. But in any case, the and then on the right, it was kind of bodily autonomy, personal freedoms, government off my back. It's that's what it is now. It, it it's just it's swung sort of wildly to the right. I think the the the, the anti-vaccine movement, I would argue, was on the run. You know, they 
Um, the, you know, their, their, their point was always the vaccines are causing all these chronic diseases, autism, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, you know, attention deficit disorder. Those are answerable questions. I mean, scientific studies can address that and did. And, and to me, I, I really thought the beginning of the end for the anti-vaccine movement, and I know this is going to surprise you, but I thought Andrew Wakefield was good for public health because it's not just that he was wrong and provably wrong, but he misrepresented data. He received right. money lawyers to essentially launder legal claims through a medical journal. Um, he was fraudulent and wrong. And, and that drove him really way to the, to the outside. I mean, he, 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 you know, he was no longer was he fed by mainstream media. I mean, he's on the Alex Jones show. He's giving talks on like the conspiracy tours. I mean, he was marginalized. And, and, and the anti-vaccine people hooked their star to him. And when he fell, they fell. I mean, to me, I thought the death knell, and no, not death knell, but at least something that clearly hurt the anti-vaccine movement was California, when they, you know, when Senator Richard Pan had SB, uh, Senate Bill 277, which basically eliminated the philosophical exemption in a state that didn't have a religious exemption. So now, if you wanted to vaccinate your child, if you wanted to, your child to go to school in California, they had to be vaccinated unless you wanted to homeschool. And, and, you know, and that eliminating the philosophical exemption, which was one of many states that started to eliminate exemptions because it was, was, I thought, pushing back against the anti-vaccine movement. Then COVID hit and, and it became a, an issue of the right. You know, there, there during that uh, insurrection, you know, the, right down the, the street, you know, there's Del Big Tree and, and other anti-vaccine activists, you know, giving talks. So it's, you know, it's sort of like burn down the house and uh, don't get vaccinated. Because yeah. It's the same sort of mindset. It's this. Yeah. Um, All extremes are hurtful. Yeah. Um, w- would I be wrong if I was counseling my patients between six months of age and 11, that this should be permissive guidance or vaccination? Uh, as you say in your book, you know, either way, uh, you're betting your life. You're either betting on the vaccine or you're betting on the illness not killing you. But I would be more comfortable telling my parents a permissive guidance would be better for your kid. If you really want the vaccine, we're glad to give it. If you're not, keep considering it. You can always come back and we'll give it to you. You see, I, I don't I think George is right in, in the sense that the mandates did create a tension that, that probably maybe didn't need to be there. But I would argue that once the right sort of took this over, it may not have mattered. But maybe that's the reason they took it over, because it was a whole bodily autonomy, personal freedom, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. Um, and, and, but, but I see if, 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 um, I mean, I'm uh, not in private practice. I, you know, I'm an infectious disease specialist at Children's Hospital Philadelphia. I see inpatients, but the, but if I were in private practice, I would strongly encourage parents to vaccinate their children. I would, I, because, because this virus does circulate because it can cause harm. And I guess we all have our biases. I, you know, have seen children suffer this C. I have seen children, just last time I was on service, we had an adolescent who was unvaccinated who had severe pneumonia from COVID. This is preventable and it's preventable safely. So I would, I would, do, I would do that. I mean, the only thing that, that is in the back of my mind that worries me a little is how long will that vaccine last? I mean, will we need to give another vaccine down the road? But again, I, I would strongly encourage it because I think it's value. Okay, vaccine. okay. Pretty good. Um, and then a uh, quick answer to this. If you're under 50, you may not need a booster. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I mean, <laughs> I, I seem to be alone on this, but I, I'll say what I think. I, I do. Um, I, I think that I'll, I'll start from the beginning. OK, when we did trials back in when, when the, 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 was, this was presented to us, the, us being the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee in December 2020, you had 95 percent efficacy for both Moderna and Pfizer's vaccine for everything, not just for severe disease or moderate disease, for mild disease. Right. So six months goes by and people do studies to see is immunity lasting and protection against serious disease was holding up really well, still in the like the 90 percent range. Protection against mild disease wasn't as you would expect because neutralizing antibodies are short lived. It's a short incubation period, mucosal infection. You're not going to be protected for a long time against mild disease. And that's what you saw. You saw that they sort of you dropped to as low as 50%, whereas we were still in the 90% range for severe disease. Then we unfortunately use the term breakthrough illness to describe a mild infection if you've been vaccinated. That's not a breakthrough. Breakthrough implies failure. That's not a failure. You won. I mean, Brett Kavanaugh, I remember, had he was tested just routinely, found to have an asymptomatic infection, which they described as a breakthrough infection on the national news. You're thinking this guy's fighting for his life. I mean, he had an asymptomatic infection because he was vaccinated. I mean, this is good. This is what you want. 
but we've been terrible about messaging this vaccine. Okay, then uh, then a year goes by. Okay, so you go from December 2020 to December 2021. And Mark Tenford at, at CDC publishes a study showing that for people who got two doses of the vaccine, we're still well protected against severe disease. No surprises. Then Omicron hit. So Omicron crossed the line. It didn't have just a handful of mutations. It had like 30 mutations. So now you have not just a highly contagious strain, you have an immune evasive strain. Even if you were vaccinated, even if you were recently vaccinated or recently infected, you could get a mild illness with this virus. And then the CDC did studies showing that if you got three doses as compared to two doses, you were less likely to be hospitalized if you got that third dose. But who were those people? Who were those people who were protected by the third dose? Because still with two doses, I would argue if you were a healthy young person, you were still protected against serious illness. Because what they found was that the people who really were, were, were aside from the fact that people unvaccinated were basically still accounting for most of the hospitalizations. But you know, if, if you looked at the um, that who was getting hospitalized, who had received two doses only, it was it was the or rather who benefited from the third dose. It was people who were elderly, the what Rochelle Walensky describes as the elderly elderly, meaning people over 70, to people who which is now me, so it's a little painful. But in any case, so the elderly elderly, people who are immune compromised, meaning just can't make a very good immune response or people who um, who had the kind of comorbidities, you know, serious heart disease, lung disease, you know, out of control diabetes, where they can't even handle mild infection, where that sort of puts them over the edge because they can't handle that two days of fever or three days of fever or moderate infection. Um, they, they were the ones who benefited. So I think you could reasonably argue that, that if this is sort of settled out, settled out as primarily a winter virus, where, you know, that's where you really see the, the uh, increase, or when a variant comes in that, you know, that really uh, is, is problematic, that those are the three groups who, who would benefit. But I don't see this as a, as a third dose for healthy young people. And, and I just like to say, I practice what I preach, or as, as an additional dose, I got I got a third, I'm, I'm over 65, so I got a third dose. I did vote for that when I was on the FDA. I did vote for that third dose for the over 65 year old based on Israeli data. Um, so I got a third dose and then a year had gone by and I had a mild illness a, a couple months ago, you know, which lasted for a couple of days and that was it. And I never took Paxlovid um, and lived. But again, there's the survivor bias for appearing on your program, right? Yes. And okay. also you, you, you are older than 50, but you take no meds. That's true. I don't. So I don't. you don't have any. You don't have hypertension, diabetes. Yeah. Uh, there's few people in America that are over fifty that don't take any meds. Yeah, the trick now, is going to a doctor, but but that's that's just my. Yes. Yeah. But I got I got to rush you along because I want to get to the book. Um, I do have one last COVID question. Um, where did MISE uh, go? Because you can't convince me that the vaccine did away with it because only three percent of the very young kids are vaccinated maybe tops 30% of the five to 11 are vaccinated, 80 to 90% of them got the disease and it's disappeared. Where did it go? Why? I think, I think these are the less virulent strains. So it's less virulence. I think, I think there was a cost for virulence paid by this virus for becoming more immune evasive. In other words, that those mutations affected virulence. I mean, this is always, it's a hard question to answer because as you get more and more population immunity, it's hard to tell whether something is less virulent. But studies out of South Africa recently, there was just a study in JAMA that, that controlled, for, controlled for it the right way, which is make sure you control for whether anybody's been previously infected. And when, when they do that, and you know, not just not vac vaccinated or not vaccinated, but previously infected. And with that, it's still a less virulent strain. And it, it, it clearly from the South African data, Omicron and the Omicron subvariants appear to cause much, much less MIS-C. Now, not no MIS-C, at least in South Africa, but much, much less. Which is, which is thankfully, that is the case. Yes, yeah. Uh, you know, thank God that disease is that, going that's a, Maybe it'll evolve to be a, a less virulent virus in general, but I'd be surprised if it ever evolved to be a virulent. I mean, I don't see it becoming rhinovirus, but, you know, we'll see. So you wrote a wonderful book. At the beginning, I got a little depressed. I recommend everybody read it at least once called You Bet Your Life. And it's the journey of medical innovation. And the reason I initially got a little depressed is because you highlight all the errors we have done as physicians that have um, led to great innovation, but no innovation in medicine is without paying a price. And unfortunately, um, as you mentioned, when you're in service and you see a child die, um, it doesn't matter that it's one in 10 million, it's the child in front of you and you gotta tell the parents their kid's not coming home. 
Um, so that's a difficult part. Public health is easy because it's, it's just numbers. Practicing medicine is taking care of people. Um, and that's a difficult part. But I loved your analogy, which basically defines what living is. Um, I have a very crude an analogy to yours, but it's uh, if you don't want to worry about getting sick or dying, you better die. Because until the day you, you stop living, those risks don't disappear. And your analogy was if you're standing in front of a lion and there's a river full of crocodiles, it might be a good idea to try to outswim the crocodiles. Explain that to our listeners, because it's a great analogy of life. You know, I was trying to describe people, for example, who have um, serious heart disease where they're not going to live very long. Um, they're willing to be, say, one of the first to get a heart transplant, or in the case of the University of Maryland recently, a pig heart, because, you know, you're willing to swim, see if you can avoid the crocodiles. On the other hand, if you if you think you can live for a few years, you know, you walk to the bridge up the road where you don't have to worry about swimming with those crocodiles. So, so the risk you're willing to take all depends on how bad your particular situation is. I think the reason I wrote the book actually was just to make the point that there has never been a medical innovation that has not been associated with the human price. It's always, and, and I'm including these. I mean, MR, the mRNA vaccines as a cause of myocarditis or pericarditis was a surprise. I mean, nobody anticipated that. I think that's probably on the basis of the fact that SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is immunologically similar in some ways to the heavy chain of alpha myosin that's on cardiac cells. So as you're making an immune response to one, you're making an immune response to the other. Nobody would have predicted the, the blood clots, including severe, severe and occasionally fatal blood clots associated okay. with the or AstraZeneca's vaccine, with the vector yeah. virus vaccines. And my point is, when the reason I, in part, I wrote the book and tried to frame it that way was expect it. Expect it. I mean, the, the uh, as I said, when when we you know when we approved these vaccines, the issue wasn't whether there was going to be a serious adverse event. The issue was how rare and how serious. That was the only issue, and and because his, history has always taught us that. So that's what I tried to do. Just put it in, in. I wasn't trying to depress people. I was just trying to say that this is always. And it's not just mistakes that people make. It's just that that's how you learn. I mean, I, and I think it may well be that the mRNA vaccines are not our last vaccine because the history of vaccine development is invariably that that the point I was trying to make in this book that the first vaccines are virtually never the last vaccines. You can always make better, safer vaccines, and I think that will probably be true yeah. here. We'll see how it plays out. Well, well, I remind people that, for example, uh, like you said. Um, watching a child die from HIV meningitis is a horrific experience. Um, most young pediatricians today and most families luckily do not encounter that pathogen. Uh, but it, there was a journey. The first one, the first vaccine wasn't as effective and we had to try it and do it again. Um, but it's still sad that these people died, you know, um, yeah, there's one other point that, that just comes up when, when, when we're on our back, when we, when we vote on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee, um, we'll often get a lot of emails, including pretty pointed negative emails from people saying, you know, uh, you know, you're basically killing their children. But the, the so when that happens, certainly before we voted on the 5 to 11 year old, to some extent before the 12 to 15 year old. And, and what people uh, it just it struck me with the 5 to 11 year old. For, so, so for the 5 to 11 year old, you had studies of several thousand children. You know, but it wasn't like with the adults where you had 40,000 for Pfizer or 30,000 for Moderna. It was several thousand. And so, and what you found was that the vaccine was for the five to 11 year old at the time, because it was still Delta, you know, you had, you know, pretty much close to 90% protection. But, but, and how did you know that? You knew that because there were children whose parents volunteered them, who, who were in the placebo group, who suffered, uh, uh, suffered COVID. That's what, that's how you learn that. And, and I think there were, you know, I forget the numbers, but let's say there were roughly, you know, say 20 that, that suffered uh, COVID that were in the placebo group. And you get these emails that said, yeah, that's all you want to do. You just want to study 2,400 children, to which I responded occasionally, okay, you want us to study 24,000. That way there's not like just say 20 cases in the placebo group, there's 200. I mean, just what kind of price do you want to pay for knowledge? Because you're always making decisions under uncertainty. You never know everything. The, the question is not when do you know everything, it's when do you think you know enough? Because there are never risk-free choices. They're just choices to take different risks. And the goal is to take the less serious risk. That's why I would be, I would find myself being uh, promoting, you know, vaccines for children. But it reminds me of the polio vaccine, which I talked about in this book a little bit because it had such an impression on me. I mean, I was, 
in a polio ward when I was five years old because of what was a failed operation on my right foot. And it was a chronic care facility in Baltimore. And, and you know, if you were in a chronic care facility in the mid-1950s, you were in a polio ward. And, um, and that, that the story of the development of the polio vaccine always really struck me because I remember my mother crying when the announcement was made that the vaccine worked. And, uh, and so how did you know it worked? How did you know the polio vaccine worked? I mean, that trial was done where uh, Jonas, Jonas Salk had tested the vaccine, his whole killed viral vaccine in, in P the Pittsburgh area in about 700 children. And he felt he had it, right? I've got the vaccine. It induces an excellent immune response. It's safe. And it broke his heart that they wanted to do a clinical trial. He could not imagine giving placebo salt water to children in the mid 1950s, knowing that every year there were, you know, 20 to 30,000 children who were paralyzed that, that by that virus, knowing that every year 1,500 children would die by that because of that virus. Nonetheless, the trial was done. Arguably the biggest medical trial in history. 420,000 children got Salk's vaccine. 200,000 got a placebo vaccine. There were 1.2 million observed uninoculated control as a nod to Salk. Salt, because he didn't want to inoculate children with salt water. He couldn't do that. He couldn't bring himself to conscience that. Okay. And so then Thomas Francis makes the announcement, right? Safe, safe, uh, uh, potent and effective. It's on the headline of every newspaper in the country. Church bells ring out. You know, synagogues hold special prayer meetings. The Voice of America announces it to Europe. You know, the, the department stores stop while that announcement is made. So how did he know it was effective? How did Thomas Francis know it was effective? He knew it was effective because 16 children died of polio in that, that trial, all in the placebo group. He knew it was effective because 36 children were paralyzed in that study permanently, 34 in the placebo group. Those were first and second graders in the 1950s. I was a first and second grader in the 1950s. Those children could have lived long and productive lives had it not been for the flip of a coin that ended up where they were in the placebo group. And I think these are sort of the gentle heroes you left be, leave behind in these kind of stories. And I'm trying to tell that in, in part in the book uh, in that way. Is it do you think, um, you know, these negative emails that you get about that you're killing children and so forth, I'm sure it comes from people that really never saw a child die. You don't hear of, I mean, you grew up in a time when children died. I remember growing up in a time where there were some kids that died in school from various illnesses, but today's generation of parent, I don't think they know of any child that dies. And if a child dies, it's like major news, but children do die. That's the reality. And polio was like, I mean, so you, I certainly knew people who had polio. I mean, it was that common, but, um, you know, it was like uh, these children had gone and fought in a foreign war, you know, and they'd come yeah. back crippled, it, it, you know, it's just because it's permanent. Yeah. And I mean, I, the, where I was, where I stayed where, for the six weeks that I was in the hospital following that, that uh, unfortunate surgery, um, it was called Cernan's Hospital for Crippled Children. And that, that was in the time when you would use words like crippled or feeble-minded in children's hospitals names. Oh, we, don't wow. for, we don't use those words anymore. So, so it was so reading the polio story was fascinating, not only because polio has disappeared, but also because during their ramp up, as you say, they made a mistake and several kids ended up with polio and a few died from the vaccination. Yeah, that was bad. That was Cutter. A Cutter Laboratories failed to fully inactivate the polio vaccine. As a consequence, about 120,000 children were inoculated with fully virulent, dangerous polio virus. 40,000 suffered uh, abortive polio, meaning short-lived paralysis. 164 were permanently paralyzed and 10 were, were killed. I think it was the worst biological disaster in this country's history. It led to the birth of vaccine regulation in this country. Um, but it was it was a seminal one. That's it. And it was it was. But when you when you looked a little deeper at that, and I actually wrote a book about that alone, I called the Cutter Incident. Um, they all the companies had a problem in activating that virus. So it gets back to my point earlier, which is that scale up is hard. Yes, yeah. uh, but it, I, again, it's a great success story. You know, uh, sad for those people that died, but we succeeded. Um, the leukemia story is wonderful too, except you know the mistake that Dr. Farber made. By giving them folate and kill, you know, well, not he didn't kill them. He precipitated the death of That's seven right. kids, but that gave us methotrexate. And, That's right. you know, um, today, um, you know, it's a tough disease, but 95% of kids with leukemia survive, which is much different than when I was in residency. Right. Um, it was also interesting to me that the first person to really receive a folic acid inhibitor for his cancer was Abe Ruth. Yes, that was a very, very cool story in your book. Uh, I'm going to touch real quickly because I don't want to abuse uh, your your kindness and your time. 
but the end of the uh, the end of the book was just tremendous, just tremendous. And you have uh, a bullet of, of things that you you can uh, expand if you want, or you can just say, "Yep," and we move on. You say nature reveals its secrets slowly. Stay humble and re re respect the requisite learning curve. Yes, I, I, and I actually have said that on national television at the beginning of this pandemic, when the uh, CEOs of these companies when they had done like phase one trials that involved 10 or 15 people would say, you know, we can make tens of millions of doses. I'm thinking, don't say that. Just be humble, man. I mean, you know, this is, uh, you're going to learn something you wish you knew now later. So just uh, stay humble. I mean, nature is, if you're paying attention, nature is humbling. Every one of the stories I tell in that book are uh, humbling, humbling um, about how hard it is to, um, to fight this war. I mean, you know, these, Mother Nature has created these these pathogens that kill us. I'm not sure, you know, who her PR team is, but uh, the word I don't know why the word natural has such cachet. I mean, Mother Nature has been trying to kill us ever since we crawled out of ocean on the land. But, um, you know, I just think you, you well, while you try and, and, and understand that war that you're in against the virus, there's going to be nat casualties when you fight back. That's always true. Yes. Here. Yes. Yeah. Your second point is all the federal guidelines lessen the chance of a disaster. They will never eliminate it. Right, because, because knowledge always comes with a price. Yes. Uh, tragedies shouldn't cause people to lose faith or get depressed like her <laughs> in the scientific endeavor. Right. It's, it's the, that, that was the point of the book, actually, just to show you that, that this, is, this is just the way it always goes. And, and see, some people go, see, they didn't know that the mRNA vaccines cause myocarditis. But remember, that's a phenomenon that occurs in roughly 1 in 20,000 people. So you're not going to find that out in a, in a trial that, that only has 30,000 people in it, 15,000 are getting the vaccine. You're not going to find that out till you're in, in a million people or so. And that's always true. And so some people go, okay, see, that's it, so I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until this vaccine, and Maurice Hilleman said it, who I think is the father of modern vaccines, in that he did the primary research and development on nine of the 14 vaccines we give to young children. He said, I never breathe a sigh of relief until the first 3 million doses are out there, because only then can I feel comfortable that there isn't a rare, serious adverse event that I didn't know about. But remember, while you're waiting, um, you're also taking another risk. And, and, and now if you look, for example, with, with myocarditis, the virus also causes myocarditis. COVID, you know, SARS-CoV-2 causes myocarditis far more commonly than the vaccine does, not surprisingly, because you're, you're presented with far more of the, the antigen, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein when you get naturally infected than when you get vaccinated. So, you know, there's, there's never risk-free choices. There's not. Um, and then you say, once the relative risks are known, choose a lesser risk, even if it might seem counterintuitive. Right. Well, see, you, you think... So people need to understand that doing nothing is doing something. But then, you know, when you, when, you, when you, for example, choose to get injected with a biological agent, which is what you're doing when you get a vaccine, that's obvious that you're doing something. But a choice not to do that is also a choice to do something. In this case, take a risk. And that's the question. Is it the more serious risk? And I think that's why people don't vaccinate their children. The, the vaccination rates in children are so low, especially in the less than five-year-old. They're scared to, at some level, inoculate their child with a biological, and, and that fear is understandable. It is. It's hard to watch that happen. But the virus is out there, so you don't see the virus. I think it would help if the virus was like a little purple dot. <laughs> then you realize how common it is out there. <laughs> and then you say some patients and doctors occasionally embrace the notion that when someone is sick or dying, any therapy is worth a shot. Yeah, and that's that's look at look at Donald Trump's therapies. I mean, when Donald Trump was admitted back in October, beginning of October, you're right, you're right, beginning like October second of two thousand twenty, he was given everything. He was given um, monoclonal right. antibodies. He even though it was, I don't think they'd been, um, they 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 were still an experimental drug. Regeneron was still experimental then. He was given remdesivir and he was given steroids. Well, the monoclonal antibodies and remdesivir did nothing for him. He was already well past the po point that that uh, viral replication was an important part of the pathogenesis. He was in the immune phase of his illness. Those steroids he probably did much to save his life. But, you know, you just do everything. He was given aspirin, he was given Pepsid, he was given melatonin, he was given zinc. I mean, it's like the notion is that when somebody's doing badly that you can't hurt them. That's not true. You can hurt them, right. um, as we know. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last point that um, you say is, in the end, no matter how well informed you are about it, a new technology, you're gambling, but you're gambling either way. Right. No risk-free choices. 
That's right. And so, like I say, until you stop living, there's a risk you'll get sick. No, I think the most dangerous aspect of getting vaccines, arguably, is driving to the office to get them. <laughs> that would be true. Well, this has been a wonderful hour spent with you. Uh, not not only myself, but many of us pediatricians admire you like a rock star. Yeah. We admire the work you have done to keep children from getting rotavirus and ending up in an ICU dehydrated. We admire how eloquent and kind and humble you've been through all these interviews that you have explained these very difficult topics, not only for us, but for society as a whole. And I'm very proud of how strong you stood against a political uh, whirlwind from all sides um, that it must not be easy uh, with all your achievements. So on, on behalf of our, our listeners, on behalf of the podcast, on behalf of humanity, thank you for the work you've yeah. done for us. Thank well, thank you. you guys. You guys are on the front line. So thank you. We try. Thank you. We try. All right. Take care. Thank you so much. Have a great day.